Chet Mercado was originally supposed to give this presentation, who was a board member on SCSI Trade Association. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Uh, I've, uh, I was vice president and president of the SCSI Trade Association for a number of years. I haven't done that in a couple of years, but I'm here as, uh, I guess, uh, doing this. So let me uh, kind of get started. You know, there's a fairly small group, so feel free to raise your hand, ask questions, whatever. And just so I can get a feel um, for how I can tailor this and which way direction. Um, how many people are kind of like end users here? More end users? And one end user, two, three, four, okay. How many people are, you know, hardcore developers doing systems? One, two, okay, about, about equal. Um, okay. So let's, let's kind of get started, the usual abstract. Let me kind of just start here with what some of the uh, takeaways here today are. Basically, how many people are pretty familiar with SAS to begin with? Fairly familiar? Not so familiar? Okay. Let me give a little background. All right. SAS is basically serial attached SCSI. It, it's very flexible. It, it handles lots of different kinds of media. Um, it's high performance. It's very scalable. And it's very hardened. So, you know, it, it's a very robust, stable infrastructure. SCSI is basically the core of every operating system's I.O. stack. Um, you know, whether it's Linux, whether it's Windows, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's basically the internal structure of the whole I.O. stack. And then in most cases, it's translated to some other protocol as it goes out, you know, on the wire. Again, it addresses, a, you know, a large growing market. It's not going away, and it also continues to evolve and add new features. SCSI is a very feature-rich protocol, for example. So let's take a look at where it's been, where, you know, some of the, uh, the past. It was basically SCSI started out as an asynchronous parallel interface, eight bits wide, grew to, you know, wider and wider. But at some point, the width was not really helping things. It went to a serial interface. Um, back around 2001, we started the activity to design SAS. It actually started shipping around 2004. It's been shipping since then. It went from 3 gig to 6 gig to 12 gig, and now it's going to 24 gig transfers. Um, again, there's a huge amount of infrastructure in the operating systems and in all your controllers that has a lot of SCSI middleware that, that allows you to go manage the devices, access devices, and it has a wide range of devices that, it, that, that are available. It's also compatible with SATA, so that not only can you, you know, hook up SCSI devices, you can plug SATA devices into the same interface through, a, through the you know, negotiation protocol when it first starts up, the OOB sequences. It allows you to determine what kind of device is there, and it will switch the, switch the protocol it's using to talk to that device based on the device it sees. And again, it's very usable from the standpoint of developing you know, high performance and high availability systems. It does have dual port, a very robust dual port capability that's been in SCSI for many years. And it's in the operating systems through multi-path controllers and multi-path within the operating system that allows you to do failover in a very robust and uh, hardened way. It's, it's been there for a while. It does it very well. It's very stable. Um, for performance, <clears throat> For example, you have wide ports. So a wide port in SCSI is, or in SAS is basically allowing you to use more than a single link to a device or to an expander. So, for example, it's very common to put four links to a single expander uh, or eight links and then have that fan out to a large number of devices. On the host side, that's actually a wide port. And what wide ports allow you to do is aggregate performance. For example, a command can go out one wire into an expander to a device. When that device finally does a read and returns data, th the data can actually come back on a different wire through the expander. It doesn't have to come back on the same wire, which allows a lot of flexibility because that routing or to different wires happens at the link layers, totally in hardware. So the software doesn't have to get involved. It's, so it's very efficient from the standpoint of getting throughput. Um, if the one link that you know you sent the command out on is busy at that time, it just comes back to another link. Very, very straightforward. It's also scalable. You can put literally a thousand devices on a SCSI interface and on a SAS interface these days. And again, 
this is expandable to new technologies. You can put SSDs, tape, you know, hard disk drives, high capacity drives, high performance drives, wide range of different uh, devices you can put on there. So taking a look at this, I mean, you see these things, you know, SCSI is used pretty much everywhere across the ecosystem, and SAS can use it for direct attached devices. So you have a system with just a number of disk drives for a particular application that works just fine. Additionally, um, you know, most of these scale-out architectures used by hyperscale de uh, deployments in, you know, the i7 or i8, depending on how you want to define them, they use, um, a lot of them use SCSI. For example, if you use, look at the OCP, the um, Honey Badger, which was the previous generation of storage system in OCP uh, that, that Facebook uses, has 30 drives and allows for a controller, you know, so it basically makes a storage subsystem with a, a uh, server, 30 drives, but it's all, it's direct attached within that box. They use SCSI for that, and then those boxes are connected with Ethernet to create their scale out storage systems. The latest version of that, Bryce Canyon, which was displayed at the last OCP back in March, I believe it was, um, expands that to a 4U rack with 72 drives, you can put one server, two servers, you could put, you can just cascade those boxes to make larger configurations depending on what your performance point needs to be. So you, it's very flexible from their standpoint is you can, they can configure that system for different tiers of storage depending on what they plug in and how they just basically cable it all together. Um, it's used in fabrics, you can, you know, create a large high, high availability uh, system by using SAS expanders, SAS switches, which are really just expanders, and you can you can actually create you know literally a thousand devices for a, a dedicated application with a lot of storage, um, external storage. You know again, very common use use case, and it supports lots of different media types. Any questions on this? Just raise your hand, shout it out, no problem. Um, again, um, you see a lot of scalability in servers hyper-converged architectures, um, basically they put an HBA in there, they put a, uh, a uh, <coughs> excuse me, a, a drive cage with a number of devices, and you can basically, that's a directly attached device within a server. And again, those servers could be, for example, a converged, a hyper-converged server, where you have basically a, um, a storage app like Ceph running on it, talking to, to a bunch of different devices, scales out very well, very efficiently. Um, again, you can extend that for outside the server box where you actually have extended DAS. Again, the Bryce Canyon, a storage server that you know Facebook is uh, proposing for the next generation storage server is exactly that. You can put, you can have 72 drives within the same box and then you can keep cascading it, you know, to cold, you know for very cold storage, you may want to put two or three boxes behind a single server. Very easy to do. And again, for very high availability, it allows uh, for you know, multi-path or dual path to each device. Each device has two ports. Um, again, um, you can use both ports simultaneously, and it's also full duplex. So you do get a very high bandwidth to each device. Your SAS expanders can be cross-coupled they allow you to have no single points of failure between those in, within that subsystem. So you have that connected to two hosts. Each host could have, you know, uh, or a host can have two different HBAs in it. Again, you can have a high availability system very easily just by how you configure these systems and how you basically plug the wires and cables into the subsystems. Again, it's natively high availability. The operating systems know about this and they work very well. Again, it's uh, very robust and easy to cable, and again, thousands of devices can be hooked up this way. Let's take a quick look at some of the protocols and compare them. Um, 24 gig SAS, um, if you take away the, you're changing the encoding scheme, <clears throat> excuse me, going to a 128, 130-128 uh, code instead of an 8B-10B, you're um, also putting uh, forward error correction in there. 
So when you subtract those overheads off, you end up with about 19.2 gigabits of, you know, user ban uh, bandwidth for the transport of the, of the actual, you know, frames themselves. If you look at NVMe Gen 4, um, you end up with about 15.7. And when you go by 4, it, it's, you know, 60, 63. I meant, I meant by 1. But you end up with 63 gigabits per second on the by 4. Latency, um, again, SAS by 1 compared with NVMe by 1 in a particular generation, you know, SAS 24 gig versus Gen 4 or SAS 12 gig versus Gen 3, you're going to see fairly similar latencies when you just look at the host bus adapter, the host software, and the, uh, the infrastructure. This, this does not take into account the, you know, the media. So what, you know, media you'd have to add in both cases. Uh, when you get to buy four, it's a little more, uh, you get a little less uh, time it takes from a latency standpoint, but it's not a dramatic amount. <clears throat> and power, power is pretty much, <clears throat> excuse me, power is pretty much um, dependent on the enclosure and what the enclosure was designed for. And there are power management feature, features within SAS and SCSI in general, so that there's a negotiation for what power level you want to run at. So you can you can adjust the power level on many devices to run at the particular power point from a savings of power, you know, keeping things green. Um, the other thing, though, is even the buy one interfaces in both cases, uh, if you're looking at SSDs, for example, you tend to run out of, you tend to saturate the single link about the same time you run out of power. So you're going to end up with about, it's going to be about nine watts in that range for if you're looking at single links in either case. Um, if you're looking at a by four, um, you can't really push it to the full max because you start running out of power within the two and a half inch envelope that those devices typically fit in if you're looking at a pluggable device. Or if you're looking at a device that plugs into a, a chem slot, those can support higher powers so you can get higher than that. But on a pluggable device that's easily user serviceable by pulling it out of, by pulling it out of a slot, you're really kind of limited to the, the 12 to 25 watts, and that depends on the OEM and the cabinet. Again, some some OEMs are going with the 12 watt range uh, to keep the power down. Some are you know pushing it up to 25. Um, if you can imagine trying to cool, you know, you can put 24 of those devices in a 2U rack. If you have 25 watts on each of those devices. And you've got four four lanes into each device. That's a very difficult, you know, power cooling solution to solve. Um, let alone the routing problem with eight lanes going, to, four lanes going to each device. The kind, the solutions I've seen on the back planes that actually do that are using 24, 28 lane, 24, 28 layer back planes in order to achieve that, which are not going to be cheap. <laughs> So you have to look at the total solution, what your cost is, what the power is, and how you want to de deploy that. Again, you know, flexibility-wise, um, both of these protocols are backward compatible at least two generations. Um, so 24 gig SAS will also handle 12 and 6. Um, NVMe, again, goes back. You, you know, NVMe drives were never really deployed on Gen 2. You don't see too many of those. So it's really Gen 4 going to and Gen 3. Manageability is another aspect. The SCSI has the SES, or SCSI Enclosure Services. It also has SMP, which is the SAS protocol for managing expanders and the configurations. Those are, again, well supported in the operating systems, as well as the management tools that a lot of vendors provide, you know, for managing your systems and servers. NVMe, that was not part of the original NVMe spec with, MV, you know, 1.0. Management was only added to NVMe, uh, as far as the spec goes, uh, about two years ago it was finally finalized. And you're starting to see early deployments of that now. So you're going. That's that's something that you have to you know be aware of when you're starting these early deployments. Is there's going to be bugs. There's going to be hardening. There's going to be some development work that still needs to be, be done in that space. That's probably one of the things that actually held NVMe back from taking off of the ramp in the enterprise uh, earlier 
than it has. You know, if you look at some of the charts I'll show later, it's it's just starting to take off now. But that you know, the lack of having that management interface is something in the enterprise in particular was something that really held it back. From availability, again, and dual ports. It's been around for a long time in the SCSI world and in SAS, works very well. There's, there were some announcements back at FMS a couple months, a month or so ago. Um, that there are some dual port NVMe drives coming out. Again, I would even call that even earlier stage of development from an NVMe standpoint for dual ports. Um, it really hasn't been put into any kind of operational environments at this point in time. It's still undergoing testing, development. The NVMe spec is uh, not as well um, documented as how, you know, all the different parameters around how that works, all the, the corner cases, you know, how you, how you handle those is still, still a work in progress. And we'll ha that'll take some hardening over time to be able to, to equal the same kind of robustness that you have, you know, standard off the shelf with something like SAS. And then channel lengths, so if you're doing backplanes, <clears throat> SAS was designed to go about half a meter in a backplane in each of the generations with three, six, 12 and now 24. Um, and what they did was that, you know, they have a, a, an equalizer for receiving and also they also have transmitter training. So the two go through a process of equalization and training until they can op actually operate on that particular channel. And it's a fairly robust DFE that's in there on the receiver side by comparison to what is specified in NVMe. NVMe Gen 4, they're saying about 10 inches of FR4. Um, versus you know, double the length in a, in a SAS environment. Um, the other thing that's different is 24 gig SAS has feed forward you know, error correction. So using a Reed-Solomon code across four frames, you can act, you know, the combination of that plus the more robust channel model gives you that extra distance compared with NVMe where you now have to place repeaters and retimers every, you know, practically speaking, six to eight inches away on backplane. So now you end up with an active backplane which has components on it which, you know, many people prefer not to have because that becomes a reliability single point of failure issue where you can still do completely passive backplanes in the case of SAS. And again, cable lanes are different. For example, SAS can go six meters you get about one meter as a spec for NVMe Gen 4. And for active optical cables, those are available up to about 300 meters for SAS, where you don't have the, the equivalent for NVMe at this point in time. So depending on the system requirements, the configuration it's gonna be doing, there's, there's a lot of flexibility for SAS. So from a bandwidth standpoint, um, SATA, topped out at six, and every once in a while, the SATA committee, you know, gets, you know, gets brought up, why don't we go to 12, and it keeps getting knocked down. Um, it's just costly to go to 12 from a SATA standpoint, from a, because six does not use any equalization or training, um, and to get to 12, we really need to do that. That adds space and it adds cost to the SATA drives, as well as putting it into the host, and, and so it's, at this point in time, um, that's not going any faster. SAS, SATA will stay at six gig. Um, Gen 3 PCI Express runs at eight. Um, SAS 12 gig. So you can see the performance per lane in gigabits per second there nominally and the bandwidth that you get from that. The interesting thing is SAS actually has more bandwidth per lane than its um, contemporary PCI Express counterpart. So if you look at a Gen 3 PCI Express versus 12 gig SAS, there's actually more bandwidth on the SAS side than on the um, host side. And the other thing is PCI Express usually tops out at about a 75% um, effective utilization le level. When you get beyond 75%, it, 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 that's about it. That's about as far as you can push it. SAS kind of tops out at somewhere between 85 to 90%. So you can actually get, you get a better utilization with the, the way in which it's framed on SAS versus the way it works on PCI Express. 
And, and one of the reasons for doing that is there are a lot of SaaS RAID controllers out there, so you actually do need a little more bandwidth on the SaaS side in, in the case of RAID, because you'll be doing you know, read, modify, writes, and things of that nature for using RAID 5. A little more on the details of the, uh, the read latencies. Um, the vast majority of the latency in, in the case of solid state is the flash media itself that by far is the biggest contributor. As far as the operating system overhead, it varies considerably between operating systems. Um, the, the Windows driver for SCSI is pretty efficient, works pretty well, and in fact, there is no native full stack driver for NVMe within Microsoft, within, within Windows. The NVMe driver actually sits under the SCSI driver. So you go through the entire SCSI stack, and then it's translated to NVMe, just like you go through the entire SCSI stack and it's translated to SATA. So there's actu it actually goes through the same, most of the same stack for NVMe as it does for SAS within um, Windows. Linux, on the other hand, the driver is fairly bloated. Um, it tends, it's not as efficient. So a lot of people, are, there's drivers out there that they put into uh, Linux that are much more efficient for NVMe. So the NVMe driver is, is actually more efficient in, in the standard Linux distributions than, than the SCSI driver. Um, and a lot of people who actually build, who built SCSI subsystems using Linux wrote their own minimal driver for the SCSI just because the, the uh, standard driver is pretty bloated. The HPA adds, adds a tiny little bit, and then the infrastructure and topology, depending on what it is, can add a little bit more. But the big, the big dominant piece is clearly the, the flash memory access times. As far as uh, enterprise shipments here, this is, is an interesting chart. You can see uh, NVMe is starting to take off on PCI Express. The interesting thing is if you looked at this chart from the analysts three years ago, it would look almost identical in that regard. Um, and again, a lot of what held that up is just the normal um, hardening process of getting a, a new interface up and running, getting the management infrastructure in place and everything else you need, the drivers, everything else you need to make that work properly. But it does look like it's starting to take off now. So we should see that kind of, kind of pick up. The interesting thing is SAS SSDs have been around and they're gonna to continue to be in that space. Um, a lot of the reason, you know, and a lot of that is, again, dual port for, for SAS because people are looking for high availability. Today, it's gonna to be a couple of years before that finally gets hardened in PCI Express. SATA has been a big piece of the enterprise SSDs for caching uh, over time, but as you can see, that's gonna start declining somewhat. Then the biggest piece of the enterprise today is now high capacity HDDs. You know, it's been, you know, what's volume shipping today is 10 terabyte drives, starting to ship 12 terabyte drives now. Those drives are gonna are make up the bulk of the, uh, the drives being shipped and in, the, in the enterprise. And the 10K, 15K drives down there at the bottom are starting to taper off. And a lot of that is being replaced by SSDs because the the cost performance point versus the cost adder of, of the SSD is, is actually a better value proposition in, 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 in compared with the you know, 10K, 15K drives. So over time, those, will, those are tapering off. But the interesting thing is this entire piece of the infrastructure from here down is typically serviced in many cases on a SaaS infrastructure whether it's SATA or, you know, or SAS drives. So it's a tremendous amount of, you know, piece of the infrastructure and capacity that's out there that's actually using SAS. Another, you know, and this is just looking at unit shipments. So the SSDs are, are no, you know, much lower capacity than the HDDs that are out there. So if you look at this as a capacity chart, you see something like this. Almost, you know, the, you know, the, the biggest piece of this is still gonna be HDD, uh, high capacity HDD 
for bulk storage, for archive, for colder data. Um, the, you know, the top piece, that little sliver, that's the capacity that's actually going to be shipping for SSDs. Still going to, relative to HDDs, it's going to be a very, still a very small piece of it. Um, you know, people are thinking that, you know, HDDs are going to be replaced in this case by SSDs. The problem is, if you look at the amount of volume there, or the amount of capacity that you need to replace, that's, you know, how many fabs would it take to do that compared, you know, to today? It, it's, you know, at, at five or ten billion dollars per fab, that's a lot of bucks. <laughs> that, that, you know, compared with HDD. Um, so SSDs, you know, are, are, are taking away the, the performance point of the HDD market, but they're not really going to touch the capacity piece of it. And again, another chart, for, you know, looking at it a little differently, expanding on just the SSDs in the enterprise, um, you can see that the, um, the purple there are being PCI Express, it's growing, so is the, SA the, the SAS piece of it. And the, uh, the SATA piece, if you look at the unit shipments and, and you know, the line, it is going down. You know, this is a different analyst from the previous one, so they've all got a little different opinion on things. But you can see the SATA is decreasing. SAS is actually you know, continuing to increase. And the, um, the, SAT, the SATA SSDs from a capacity point are, are increasing, but from, a, from a, a unit count, they're going down. So what is the largest HDD drive that you know about today that's... Shipping? Yeah. 12. There's 15 terabyte SSD. Yeah, but, okay. what, but what's the cost? I know. That's, that's the thing, right. Yeah. But if the customer wants that speed and that, that capacity, they're paying for it. Right. Oh, yeah. No question. They'll pay for it. Yeah, but, but... That capacity doesn't usually come with the high end speed. Right. No, it, it, it's 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 it really comes down to cost and efficient cost and efficiency, right? Yeah, I mean we we can we can sustain close to twelve to the twelve gig SSD. Twelve terabytes, rather. On okay, we can have a discussion on you know, yeah. yeah. Where, where do you see the hybrid drives? They weren't very successful. They weren't very successful because the you don't have a lot of context in the drive around what's the best thing to do around caching. They uh, they do um, the read caching. You, you improve the hit rate a little bit, but by putting that cache in say a storage controller or in the in the server. You have, a, you, first of all, you have context around how you're going to use it. And secondly, it's going to be bigger, so it can be more efficiently used than it is by putting little pieces in each drive. You may have a drive that has a small amount of cache in it, but, or, or, or a cache in it, but it, if it isn't being, that drive is not being hit or accessed, it's going to waste, right? Whereas if you put it and aggregate it at a layer above that, it's much more efficient overall. So if you talk to most system designers, you want to put the faster memory as close to the CPU as possible for the caching. Okay. So where is it going? I mean, we're at 24 gig now is the, uh, the, the one that's coming up. The, uh, the way they read this chart is the very beginning of the line is where the first plug fest is typically going to be held. And that's going to be right now towards the end of 2018. Um, these transitions are very much aligned with the different generations of PCI Express coming out. So the controllers designed for 12 gig were designed to work with Gen 3 PCI Express. Controllers for 24 gig are designed to work with uh, PCI Express Gen 4, and that's that's a lot a lot of why these are aligned in the way they are in time frame wise. About 12 to 18 months after 
those first plug fests is typically where you see system shipments starting. Uh, so it takes a little time to get through the debug process, to get all the, you know, every, all the kinks worked out. And 12 to 18 months after that is where you start seeing real ship, shipments from system vendors. Um, there is a next generation on here. Um, there's a lot of work actually going on in the Ethernet community around 50, 56 gig Ethernet. Um, SAS has always leveraged a lot of the work that goes on in the Ethernet community around the FIs and how they work and the technology there. So that is there, that's being worked on in, in the Ethernet space. The alignment here is where consensus seems to be around where Gen 5 PCI Express will start to come out in that 2021, 22 timeframe. We'll see how well that works. Um, it's pretty tough to get Gen 4 out. It's going to be tough to get Gen 4. Gen 5 is going to be even more of a challenge, and instead of 10, 10 inches, you'll probably get about 5 or 6 inches of FR4 to work with. <laughs> those 24 gigs has, those are both HDD and SSD? Or? S you'll we'll see SSDs. HDDs, it's not clear yet. Um, I don't know of anyone who's who right now is thinking about 24 gig HDDs, uh, just because you really don't need it. And SAS with the expanders have buffering built into the expanders to do more efficient um, mixing of different speeds. So even if it goes from 12 gig from the, an HDD to an expander, there's a buffer in the expander. The expander will automatically buffer up amount, renegotiate, a, open a link to the host, burst that out at 24 gig, shut down the link, let someone else use it. So the buffering actually, you know, so it, it, it does it fairly efficiently. So, so you don't really need to upgrade each device every time in that case. So what you're saying that are focusing more on SSDs than HDDs. 24 gig is probably going to be much more focused on SSDs than HDDs. Um, there are improvements in the buffering that will make, you know, that are coming. It was available in the 12 gig. People have gotten a more robust buffering, putting it to 24 gig. There are some other things that are being put into 24 gig for more fairness, and I'll get to that in a little while around, around how you do the negotiation so that slow devices don't starve out the high, higher speed devices. Um, <clears throat> so 24 gig has advantages in that regard in being able to just handle more devices in parallel. You, you get a better scalability going to 24 versus the 12. You're going to get scale out to larger and larger configurations. And as you know, Intel keeps adding more and more cores to processors for these large storage subsystems, you're starting to see more and more drives beside, behind each of the, one of these servers. You know, again, the Facebook example of going, you know, you know, if you go back five, ten years, these hyperscalers typically had, um, you know, eight to twelve drives behind a, uh, a server. That's gone to thirty. You know, going to 70, 72 with Bryce Canyon. Bryce Canyon is expandable to you know multiple racks. So you're going to start seeing high, larger and larger configurations behind a single server for a lot of these scale out architectures. Just sure. On-premises enterprise space, almost every drive gets sold in an aggregating subcarrier chassis. Correct. It doesn't go in standalone. Right. It doesn't plug directly into a bus as it does in the cloud space where they're laying on top of the software layer across many systems. Right, right. So the drive's going to be subcarriers. And, and today, we just SAS chain those together. Right. And we use 24 drive. We use the new 92 drive chassis. Mm-hmm. We have three and a half inch form factor, but we have little subcarriers that let us plug two and a half and mix them with the three and a half. Mm -hmm. So it's very flexible. But I'm wondering what you think about uh, mixed protocol chassis where we can still chain the chassis together with SAS, but we can plug CIE and the. What? Well, the, that's the other thing that is coming. You, you starting, there are some vendors out there that are going to be doing uh, tri mode expanders. So you can have an expander. You can plug the expander into a SAS HBA. You can also plug that expander into a PCI Express lanes, and then you can mix and match. So it really does two functions. It does PCI Express switching and SAS switching in the same expander. What really turned that on was when things like uh, distributed RAID replaced the traditional RAID, mm -hmm. and it moved up into the software-defined storage right. layer. 
right, all of a sudden we didn't need any functionality in the storage subsystem. All we needed was to chain SAS drives out. Right, and, uh, and, and it does that very well. Yeah. Right. So that's why we've been using, I guess, the majority of it in that manner. Right. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about some of the latest uh, innovations that have been added to SCSI and SAS. Storage intelligence is one of them, persistent connections, enhanced power control, and I won't talk in detail about these, but basically, you know, just like PCI Express has power control where you go through a negotiation and decide what's, what power level you want to run at, Serial Hash SCSI or you know, SCSI itself does also have the same kind of protocol. It's you, you, you query the drive, the drive says I can run at this protocol, the host says okay, do this, and you can actually adjust the power level, particularly for SSDs, okay, because you know power and performance go hand in hand with SSDs. You want more performance, you gotta put more power into it for bandwidth. And then shingled magnetic recording support, that's something else that's coming along. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about these. Storage intelligence, it, yeah. Yeah, S SMR had a number of uh, perturbations in its, its evolution. I mean, the first ones that came out were drive managed, okay, and the performance on those was not very good. But where you saw those were, you know, one vendor was putting those into external storage boxes for backup, and for backup, it worked fine. It doesn't work, you know, the host, the drive managed stuff does not work well in a generalized environment because of all the read, modify, writes, and keep moving things around with random accesses. Um, you have host managed and then host aware. Most of the things seem to be moving, the interest level moving towards host managed now. Um, and a lot of the interest is coming more from the hyperscale space rather than the general purpose space because they've got much more control over how they're using these. So they're looking at doing that. And the other thing that's coming in that space is some dynamic SM, you know, hybrid SMR. Because you have a little bit of you know, conventional CMR and you have some SMR. Today, you know, the, the first few blocks of an SMR drive is conventional magnetic storage, and then the rest is SMR. What's being talked about now is making that dynamic so that the system can change a, for example, one of the a group of um, SMR, you know, uh, ranges from running an SMR to, to, to running it into a CMR mode and vice versa. Now, what happens in that case, though, is the SMR, you, you're going to have different capacities when you're running in different modes. So a lot of this discussion around how you might do that is you know, how do you manage that? How do you present it to the host? How do you, you know... How do you report that and, and change those? And, and the intent is to change those fairly quickly. So people want to basically use it as an SMR drive, but also use the, the, the uh, use it as a CMR drive, but then have a section, typically on the inner bands, that'll be more SMR for archival or for cold data. So they can, across an entire fleet of drives, they can adjust the amount of capacity and for SMR versus CMR and play with that over time. As things get cold, they can move it between one place and the other. Okay, you don't preserve the data when you make that change, obviously. Okay, but the intent is to be able to dynamically adjust how much of the drive is CMR versus SMR. Oh, 10 minutes, wow, okay, almost done. Um, so storage intelligence, the intent about this is particularly streams is if you think of a, an environment where you're running a drive and it's being shared by multiple VMs. So each VM has been assigned a chunk of address space in this drive. You've got all these VMs writing to the drive. And with an SSD, you typically have an erase block and you're writing requests in a sequential manner and remapping all the LBAs. The problem is now when one of those VMs goes away, you eliminate its it's space, but you and reclaim that, but now you end up with a bunch of holes. And over time, you have to continually, you know, do garbage collection, compaction. What Streams does is identify 
those device, those uh, requests that are likely to be are likely to have a similar lifetime and be deleted at the same time. So v one VM identifies that it's stream one, it goes to a particular erase block. VM number two goes to a different erase block. So when it, you you know when a VM goes away, you do uh, you know you basically uh, trim that address space. You're only affecting the erase blocks that th that it was using. So it ends up being a lot more efficient. You reduce uh, write amplification. You improve performance. Where does the hint come from? The uh, storage subsystem or the, the uh, HPA? It comes from it comes from the uh, it gets assigned by the Apple. It, See, it would be in the you know when when a, when a particular VM gets assigned a a, uh, um, a LUN or effectively the LUN it's going to use that LUN it, it gets tagged as it goes through the stack would get tagged as it goes through the stack as being you know stream A B C or D whichever one it happens to be. So it's not it, it, get, it gets it gets it gets paired with the LUN typically. It, it depends. It's, sometimes it's the application and sometimes it's the OS. Right. Right. So does that just pull out and look? boundary or is it actually supported by something as part of the SAS command set? Well the stream the stream identifier is part of the SAS command set, but how it gets assigned is either by Yeah, yeah right. The, the ID comes to the device, the device figures out where to play. Right. With the other stream IDs. Right. And again it's a hint, you know, and hints are optional, right? <laughs> so it could get the hint and it could ignore it too, right, in theory. But obviously it, it provides a lot of benefit from the standpoint of, you know, performance improvement and um, reduces, you know, it helps improve endurance. And then there's background activity control. I mean, SSDs occasionally have to do background activity just like, and, and HDDs too. Um, garbage collection, scrubbing, a number of activities. Um, and very often... Um, you don't want that to happen during your peak operational period. So you want to tell the driver, give it a hint, saying, now might be a good time to go house cleaning, uh, you know, middle of the night or something when nothing's happening. Or say, right now, hold off on background stuff so that, you know, you can give me maximum performance and more predictable performance. And then the improved buffering and fairness, again, that allows for mixing of different speeds within the same infrastructure. And uh, so, again, I, I don't think I need to go through this. Single magnetic recording, you get improvement in density uh, and lowers the cost per gigabyte. And you need that over time to, to maintain a, a, a better cost curve. So as far as the speed, um, why? Well. I mean, look at how much data is being produced. I think people have seen this slide in various forms through many conferences. But you know, if you look at you know, hundred out five hundred hours of video uploaded every minute. That's a tremendous amount of, of HD video. That, you know, again, that's a tremendous amount of data. I mean, if you look at over, you know, summarizing this overall, if you look at the projections of the current consumption rate of storage is running about. Uh, for the hyperscale guys, it's probably about a 50% per year capacity growth. For traditional enterprise, it's probably closer to around 30% right now. Gives it, gives it a total average of somewhere around 40% per year. Um, aerial density curves are probably more in the 15% per year for, for disk drives. Right now, flash is probably 25% per year. That's probably going to come down, and, and within the next few years, they're likely to be on nearly parallel paths. So that means lots more drives from a connectivity standpoint to get to that 40% growth rate in total capacity. The numbers of drives shipments in both cases are going to go up, and you're going to need more and more connectivity. So again, the, you know, the basic objectives backward compatibility, flexibility, improvements in performance, and again, all the you know, reliability, scalability, flexibility, you know, all the other things going along with that. So again, just the key messages here, basically, flexibility, scalability, and uh, you know, 
the architectures, the you know, very large, it's still going to be a very large growing market. You're going to need to connect all those devices as you're going to need more and more devices over time. It's, it's, it's not going to get smaller. You're not going to need, you're going to need more and more devices to meet the demand of the data being generated. So, so with that, any questions? Going once, going twice. All right, thanks a lot, folks.